Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. You'll find my uh, 12 verse assignment there. We want to read verses 1 through 11 of Acts chapter 2. Glory to God. Today at the end of service, we will remember the, Jesus' work of redemption through the symbols of communion. Uh, we'll remember his broken body and his blood that was shed for us. For the Bible declares, without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. And so we'll remember that. Um, through communion at the end of this, uh, work, toward the end of this worship experience, got a little excited there. I forgot we're supposed to be, supposed to be uh, welcoming those who graduated New Start. And so we'll do that uh, after communion, I believe. I just wanted to get to the word while his spirit is here. In addition to it being communion Sunday, it is Pentecost Sunday. And... Yes, Lord. And for those of you who may not be familiar with, with the occasion, Pentecost Sunday is a Sunday where we celebrate and we commemorate the Holy Spirit who was given to the church. And so now it's no longer, he's no longer meant for a bunch of unique or special people. He's no longer meant for just kings. He's no longer reserved for just priests. But now anybody who puts their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ, the Bible says at that moment they are sealed with the Holy Spirit. And so today is unique in a sense that we are celebrating Jesus' redemptive work and remembering that, but also the fulfillment of his promise for when he was concluding his earthly ministry, he says, I will not leave you by yourself, but I will give you a comforter, and he will be with you forever. And so today, uh, I want to read what should be a familiar passage of scripture to many, but I recognize some may be reading it for the first time, and I'm excited about that. Happy you're here. Um, and so let's read Acts chapter 2, verse 1, and then I'll conclude my reading at verse 11. I'm reading the New International Version. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Verse 2 says, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Perhaps now I want to give you my assignment early. That word speak in other tongues uh, there in verse number four. That word tongues may be highlighted, circle it, underline it so you'll remember it. That word there, tongues, it implies languages. So they spoke in other languages. If you see it in the original language of Greek, as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were, stay, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Verse 7, utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? That's huge. Verse 8, then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language. Look at the people who were there, Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. Verse 10, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome. Verse 11, both Jews and converts to Judaism. 
Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. I said verse 11. Let's just read on anyway. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Let's uh, turn our focus here to about uh, two or three, three, four verses. Verse number four, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Verse five, now there were some now, there were staying in Jerusalem, God freeing Jews from every nation under heaven. Look at this. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard their own, you may want to circle or underline this, highlight it, whatever you need to do, their own language being spoken. I want to deal with that, that language, their own language. That word tongues there at the top in verse number four has to do with language, but that word language down here in verse number six has to do with dialect. You'll see it in the original Greek as dialecto, dialect. They heard their own dialect being spoken. Verse seven, utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Let's prayerfully consider the languages of men. The languages of men. The languages of men. Father, we thank you that your word is blessed in our hearing, in our reading, and in our doing. Speak to your people. We declare in advance we'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. You could take your rest. Thank you uh, for standing with me for that time. I came across an article that was uh, very interesting to me, and the article was titled, Losing Languages, Losing Worlds. Losing languages, losing worlds. Perhaps you could still Google it uh, and find it and read it in your own time. But it was titled Losing Languages, Losing Worlds. And it talks about how the world's languages are dying. And then it talked about how the pandemic didn't help uh, in that effort. It exacerbated it. It kind of sped it along uh, where we are losing languages. After scouring the Internet, uh, for research and trying to find the exact number, I couldn't find it, but I came to the conclusion that the most highly respected linguists seem to settle between seven and 8,000 languages are spoken around the world. Between seven and 8,000 is the estimate of most respected linguists. Now look at this, 42% of modern languages are endangered right now. 42%, that's huge whether you know it or not. Almost half of the modern languages we're speaking right now are endangered. One fifth or 20% of those seven to 8,000 languages will be dormant or dead by the end of the century. 20% of the languages we're speaking right now in the world will be dormant or dead by the end of the century. And while it may seem misguided to focus on language loss in a time like this, when we have war on one front of our world in Eastern Europe and we have economic upheaval on our home front here nationally, whispers of another economic downturn on the horizon, it would seem misguided to talk about language loss when we can't even mourn one mass shooting long enough before another one takes place. It would seem misguided to talk about language loss. But language is more central to our survival than we might think. Language is key to understanding culture. And when I think of culture, I think of the way people dance, I think of the way they dress, I think of the way they eat, I think of the way uh, they like to have fun, the way they celebrate, the way they have their, their ordinances and how they celebrate babies being born and getting married. All of those things together 
summarize or, or, or define culture. But language is what ties that culture together. John McWhorter, he's an interesting gentleman, a big fan of his. I watch him on one of my favorite political shows on TV. Uh, he is a linguistics uh, professor at Columbia University. He writes this. He has a bunch of interesting TED Talks. If you want to Google those and watch them on YouTube, dealing with language and speaks. He, he, in speech, he writes, the realities of speech are much more complicated than the words used to describe it. He says the realities of speech are much more complicated than the words used to describe it. He says when it comes to language, there are many things to consider. There's the language itself. There's the dialect. There's the accent. There's the language family. There's what's called the language isolate or isolate languages. All of these things and much more, I just listed a few, fall under linguistics. And he says when you want to tell the difference between language and dialect, it can be very difficult. He says when considering the difference between language and dialect, it is surprisingly difficult once you get into the details. Because the exact distinction can be a bit murky. The distinction between language and dialect can be difficult because they overlap. They fall into one another. So it's kind of hard to, 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 to set them apart. Really, there's no exact difference. But for our talk today, I'll define it like this. A language is a method of communication, either spoken or written, consisting of the use of words in a structured and conventional way. A language is a method of human communication, either spoken or written, consisting of the use of words in a structured and conventional way. That's language. So language is a system of communication used by a particular group of people, a particular country, or a particular community. That's language. But when we get to dialect, dialect is defined as a particular form of a language which is peculiar to a specific region or social group. Dialect is a particular form of language which is, which is peculiar to a specific region or social group. So dialect, dialect is a variety of a language. Dialect is a variety of a language. Dialect can signal a bunch of things. Dialect can signal where a person comes from. Dialect can signal someone's social background. And so even when it comes to dialect, they have levels of dialect or ways to put dialect into different groups. They have what's called regional dialect, where people in a particular region speak the language a certain way. Then they have under that regional dialect false accents. People in certain areas have certain accents. They pronounce certain things. I know we all speak the same language here, but just to give you a, a modern day or example that we're used to, kind of people in New York talk a certain way. People from Baltimore talk a certain way. People from Texas talk a certain way. People from the West Coast talk a certain way. And so even though we're speaking the same language, you get what I mean. When that, that would fall under dialects, and then you get the accent. So you have languages. Then you have dialects. Under dialects, you can have accents. And under dialects, you can have regional dialects. You can have what's called class dialects, where a dialect can reveal someone's social background. Then you have what's called occupational dialects. A dialect can be a clue to someone's occupation or what they do for a living. So you have languages. You have dialects. You you have accents. Then you have what's called a language family. 
You just wait on me here and just pray with me for a second. Then you have what's called a language family. I got languages, I have dialects, I got accents. Then you have what's called a language family. A language family is a group of different languages, but they all descend from a particular common language. A language family. And so a language family is when you have a group of languages that are different, but they descend from one common language. If we were to give you some present day uh, examples, there's what's called the Niger-Congo language. That's, that's, the, that's the proto-language, or what's called the parent language, if we want to get specific. The proto-language, or the parent language, that's the big language, and everything descends from that. In present day, some of the big proto-languages are the Niger-Congo language. There's between 1,200 and 1,500 languages on the planet right now that descend from the Niger-Congo language. You and I, we speak English. But English is actually not a parent language. It's not a proto-language. English is what's called a daughter language. English descends from an Indo-European language. And the same language family with us is Spanish, French, German, Russian, Punjabi, on down the list, Bungabi, just a bunch of languages all descend from one language. That's what's called a language language family. One big language up here and thousands and thousands of languages descend from this one language. So you have languages, you have dialects, you have accents, you have language families. Then you have what's called language isolates. Language isolates. These are isolated languages that can find no proto-language. They don't know how these languages got here. These languages just are here, and they, they have no parent language. Modern-day examples of those are Korean. Korean has no proto-language. It has no parent language. It doesn't descend from anything. It's its own isolated language. Right now, probably the place with the most language isolates in the world is Papua New Guinea. They are the most linguistically diverse nation on the planet. It's between Indonesia down there and Australia and the down under, so to speak. So you have languages, you have dialects, you have accents, you have language families, you have language isolates. I wanted to present all of that to you as we approach our reading this morning in Acts chapter 2. We can get so used to reading something that we read over and not recognize the miracle that is taking place. In Acts chapter 2, the immediate context, uh, you'll see it in the last chapter, is Jesus has just ascended, gone back to heaven. His earthly ministry uh, is over. It has been concluded, and he says, go to Jerusalem and wait for a gift. That's the immediate context. The larger context is now we're in the new covenant. The new covenant, because the Bible, above, uh, uh, among other things, is a book of covenants. You have, some don't like to put it this way, but I believe there was an Adamic covenant. I believe God had to be in covenant with Adam, even though you don't see the exact wording on the pages of Scripture. But, but some don't. But, but I believe there's an Adamic covenant. God made a covenant with Adam. Then he had made one with Noah. We see that one. Then he made one with Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant. Then he made one with David, the Davidic covenant. So we have all of these covenants, and now they're under the new covenant. So in the immediate context, Jesus' earthly ministry is over. They're waiting on a gift. In the larger context, they're under the new covenant. In the greatest context, the largest context, Jesus now says, I want you to continue my ministry of reconciling a fallen world back to God. And so I want you to take up what I did. The ministry won't stop. It'll just transition. It'll switch forms. And I want you to pick up where I left off. So immediate context, Jesus is gone. Great, larger context, new covenant. Greatest context, the church is being birthed and must continue the work of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus, before he leaves, Matthew 28, Christians, he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given me. 
where did he say, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. When things are going to get dark, they're going to get murky, they're going to get gray, there's going to be some rainy days, but lo, I am with you always. Even until the end of the world, King James still in me, end of the age, <laughs> you'll see in the NIV. You won't see the and lo. That's why every once in a while I still like to read the King James. I don't even know what that fully means. I wasn't born in that time to speak that language, but it just sounds good. And lo, I'll be with you always. <laughs> Even until the end of the world. Whenever I leave the house now, I tell my wife, and lo, I venture to go to the gym and I shall be back in an hour and a half. And lo, I shall go to the grocery store and I shall return. So Jesus gives them this instruction to go into all the world. And preach this gospel message. Here's point number one. You may want to write this down. When God gives you a command, or when God gives you a charge, a charge, a command, whatever it is, he must equip us with the tools necessary to carry out that command or that charge. When God gives us a command or a charge, he must equip us with the tools necessary to carry out that command or that charge. God does not call us to something to have us fend for ourselves. He's with us. He provides for us. He enables us to finish the assignment. Where God calls you somewhere, he won't have you go into something and you have nothing. Even if it looks like you have nothing, you have everything that you need. You may go into battles with giants and you have no swords, but you do have rocks and a sling. You have what you need. Oh, glory to God. You may see thousands of Philistines coming your way, and you have nothing in your hand. But if you look, there's a jawbone right there. You have what you need to complete the task. It may not look like it right now, but you have what you need to accomplish what God wants you to accomplish in this season. I don't know about the one in the future. I don't know about next year. I don't know about the next five years. But for where you are right now, you have what you need. I've seen some pretty preachers, pretty preachers say it like this. They say, where God guides, he provides. Where God directs, he protects. Where God wills, he'll foot the bill. All of those, I've heard all those before. Where God guides, he provides. Where God wills, he'll foot the bill. Oh, where God directs, God will protect. God will never call us to something and not equip us with the tools necessary to carry out the task. So how can I go into all the world? And if I don't speak the languages, Either somebody around me is going to have to have some Rosetta Stone software. Somebody around me is going to have to pull out their cell phone, pull up that Google Translator, type something in and give it to people. How am I going to go into all the world, Jesus, if I don't speak the languages? So on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says the disciples had been praying until it was time for the spirit to descend. And when he came down and rested on them like cloven tongues of fire, at that moment he gave them, watch this, the languages of men. The 
the languages of men. Acts 2 verse 4. I told you one of my focus verses. Let's read it right there. Acts 2 verse 4. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues. As the Spirit enables them, that word translated tongues, I told you to underline it, circle it, highlight it, whatever you need to do to remember it. It's the same one we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In the original language, it's glossa. It's where we get our English word from glossary. Glossary. And so it has to do with languages. The disciples actually spoke languages. Literal, earthly languages speaking in tongues that we read here in Acts chapter 2 was a language speaking in a foreign language that they did not know in order to communicate with someone from that said or same language can I preach this morning so those early believers were supernaturally enabled to speak languages they had never learned before they spoke literal foreign languages from different native tongues. They, they, they had cross-cultural communication. They spoke languages. It enabled them to, to fulfill the go into all the world portion of the Great Commission. Languages. It didn't help them shout. I'm going to step on some toes this morning. You don't mind. It didn't help them feel good. I'm sure they felt good, but, but that wasn't its primary purpose at this moment. It, 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 it wasn't meant to just give them a chill up their back. It wasn't meant to, to, to go down to their feet where it's just a step and then everybody goes home. But the primary purpose of them being filled with the Spirit and giving tongues is so they could tell somebody. I'm going to shout all by myself this morning. The primary purpose is for the gifts as we are given these gifts so we can tell somebody. Touch somebody and say, you got to tell somebody. <laughs> Who have you been talking to? Who have you been speaking about to me? Speaking to me about? Who have you been telling about? Telling me about? Y'all get what I'm trying to say. Who have you told about Jesus? Says I've given them the language of men. And we cannot watch me here. Lose the ability to speak the languages of men because the language of humanity is our greatest connection. Can we go just a little bit deeper this morning? I'm slow on purpose so you don't lose me here. I want you to internalize what I'm saying. Can we peel back the onion and take it just a little bit deeper? Can we give some application for today? For everything, maybe write this down, remember it. For everything God calls you to, there's a language to go with it. For everything God calls you to, there's a language to go with it. We're up here now. Can we come down here? For everything he calls you to, there is a language to go with it. If you're going to reach them, you have to know how they speak. I'll say it again. I'll make it corporate. If we're going to reach them, we have to know how they speak. 
I don't care what industry you're in. I don't care what type of work you do. For every industry, every type of work, every type of occupation, there is a language that comes with it. There's a language coupled with it. I don't care what it is you do. My background, my formal training is in business management. When it comes to business and management and administration, there's a language. When you start talking about project management, there's all types of languages for managerial processes. You have uh, a six Sigma language, you have uh, agile language, you have uh, hybrid languages, you have all of these things, all the types of these management principles, all these things that they teach you in school to deal with languages. You have waterfall, you have scrum, and some of you are looking at me like that's crazy because that's the language of that industry. As a pastor, preacher, teacher, whatever you want to call me, there's a language that we speak. When I talk to other pastors, when I talk to other leaders, there's a language. There's certain things we listen for. There's certain things that we know what we're talking about. We just call it preacher talk. There's a language. What's up? Uh, you know, uh, that's how we say There's a language that goes with it. There's a language. There's a language to what my wife does in health care. There's a language. She's been a pharmacy tech for pharmacy technician for almost 20 years. So when it comes to anything in healthcare with our boys, she works with doctors on a daily basis. They come together and put together prescriptions. She tells them when they got their measurement of their prescriptions wrong. So so why am I trying to go in the room and take the lead and I don't even speak the language? There's a language, and she teaches me just a little bit of it. Did you, for the longest time, I just learned what acetaminophen was, and I say that all the time just to get out. Did you give the boys acetaminophen? What are you talking about? For years, acetaminophen. <sighs> Did you give the boys Tylenol? Then why don't you just call it Tylenol? Because that's not the official name. It's called acetaminophen. talking about acetaminophen and, and naproxen and tabernophen, all these different names and so, but that's the language of her industry. When I want to talk to her about weightlifting and things I try to do in the gym, she looks at me sideways because there's a language, you know, brother. There's a language. There's sets and there's reps and I'm trying to get hypertrophy and time under tension. You know what I'm talking about. Trying to do all these things to get bigger to keep her. But, but there's a language. There's a language to every industry. There's a language to music. I'm trying to learn some of the language. I'm not going to be able to know it in depth like Minister Phil Slater and Dr. Beverly and Minister Brochel and others learn it, but, but, but I need to learn some of the language. Where am I? Am I in D? Am I in E flat? I don't know. Am I in C sharp? Where am I? But there is a language. There's a language to finance. Finance has a language. As we're hiring some, some people for some remote services with, 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 with the retirement of our dear friend, I, I'm trying to learn their language. I can speak it to a degree with my background in business, but there comes a point where it gets so high because that's their background where I tell them you got to download some of that because that's the language. They can look at all types of financial statements and cash flow statements and, 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 and all of these statements, balance sheets and all these things, profit and loss and all of these things. That's a language. I was talking to some young person and I told them you can't, not, you can't afford to not know what an NFT is. You can't afford to not know what cryptocurrency is. My parents and the generations after them, they'll be able to get by, but there's no way the way things are looking, the way it's going, you're going to be able to survive, and you can't tell me what an NFT is. That's the financial language of the future. So to everything, there is a language. To every assignment, there comes a language. God, if he's assigned you to something, you have to learn the language. Even, glory to God, can y'all receive this in the spirit? If you hear it in the natural, you're going to hear me wrong. Even when it came time to save humanity, 
God have to speak our language. What are you talking about, Pastor Gabriel? He spoke the language of divinity. But in order to save us, he had to speak the language of humanity. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. So now where God maybe couldn't find some connection, and he could, but you get it in the spirit. Maybe where God couldn't reconcile or understand fully when he put on a human suit. Came down 42 human generations, walked the earth like you and I did. He said, I now know the language of tired. I now know the language of weak. I now know the language of being susceptible to sickness and disease. I now know the language of being in one place at one time. If I'm going to save you, I'll speak your language. And this is what makes the intercession of Jesus Christ so powerful because now he speaks our language. He sits on the right hand of the Father, fixes up my prayers and hands it over to God and said, I'll speak his language. So when I yell, Father, I need you. He speaks my language. When I yell, Father, I'm weak and my body can't seem to make it. He speaks my language. Touch somebody and say, God speaks your language. Jesus speaks your language. He knows how you feel. He knows when you're being tempted. He knows when you're weak. He knows when you're getting ready to give in. He was tempted in all points, yet without sin. He speaks your language. So we don't serve a God who doesn't speak our language. We serve a God that when we get down on our knees, he knows exactly the way I feel. He knows exactly what I'm trying to say. Even when I can't put my feelings into words, but because he speaks my language, he says, I know exactly what you need. And before you call, I have already answered because I speak your language. Pastor Gabriel may not get how you feel, but that's all right. I speak your language. Deacon so-and-so may not get what you're going through, but I speak your language. People don't understand why you're always crying, but I speak your language. My soul has been crushed to the point of death so I can speak your language. I'm well acquainted with sorrows. They called me the man of sorrows. I was well acquainted with grief because I speak your language. Somebody in the room, is anybody sick? He speaks that language. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. He speaks my language. Slap somebody and say, he speaks your language. He speaks our language. And so whenever there's an assignment, there's a language attached to that assignment. There's something that goes with it. We have educators in our church. There's a language that goes with that assignment. We have people in the music industry or people who want to be in the music industry. 
There's a language that goes with the industry. Do you know the latest language? Are you still speaking the old language of album sales? Glory to God. That's old language. If you're going to get paid as a singer today, you got to speak the language of digital sales. You got to know how does Spotify pay me? How does Apple Music pay me? I got to speak the language. Watch this. If I don't know the language, how am I going to get paid? And people who are impoverished, who are poor oftentimes, is because they don't know the language. Let me slow down now. We got way off. <laughs> it's because they don't speak the languages. Watch this. Write this one down. Point number three. The more languages we are willing to speak, the more people God can use us to reach. The more languages that we are willing to speak, the more people God can use us to reach. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting at verse number 19. The Apostle Paul uh, gives us this idea in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting at verse number 19. Watch what he says here. He says, he's talking about reaching people. Look what he says. Though I am free and belong to no one, Watch what he does. I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. So look what he does. Verse number 20. To the Jew, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, what did I do? I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law. Keep going. Verse number 21. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. Verse 22. To the weak, I became weak. I have become, watch this, all things to all people. So that by all possible means, oh, glory to God. Y'all better hear what I'm saying this morning. I might save some. I'm not going to be able to save everybody. I'm not going to be able to reach everybody. But to get, oh, God, but to allow God to maximize his work in me, I'm going to open myself up. To find acquaintance with every kind of person. Some of you, I, I feel like I'm preaching this because God is getting ready to send some people to some places. And the only thing that could stop you are your walls. Didn't they sing that today? Spirit break out, break, break our walls down. Break down our walls. Break down our traditional walls. Break down our systems of thinking. Break down our religious backgrounds. There's some places God may want to send you to. And you're hesitant to go because they're not Baptists. There may be some places that God may want to send you to. But your hands is it to go because everybody there got tattoos. There may be some places that God is sending you to. But you're a little afraid to go because everybody wears their hair a little weird over there. You have to allow yourself, oh glory to God, be open to how God wants to use you. The more languages you are willing to speak, the more people that you can reach. Somebody shout the languages of men. I don't know who this word is for this morning, but God is getting ready to elevate somebody in a particular arena or industry. You just have to be open and willing to speak the language. 
God is getting ready to send somebody into the prison, but you got to speak prisoner language. There's a way you walk, chaplain. There's a way you talk. There's a hardness that you got to have. Can you speak the language? Somebody's getting ready to start a ministry, but God needs to strengthen your legs a little bit so you can carry some more weight, so you can learn to speak the language. The languages of men. The languages of men. Many of you came up in the generation... I probably was the last generation who remembers this. You'll know, and you'll remember it the second I say it. When the old saints used to say, and they meant well, we know what they meant, when they used to say, come on from out there. Come on out of that world. They used that passage, that Corinthian passage, where it was talked about intermingling in marriage between an unsaved person and a saved person, but they would use that and say, come from among them. And be ye separate. Can I ruffle some feathers just a little bit this morning? We understand what they meant in that time. But that was the language of that generation. Holy Spirit now has a new language. And the language is now I'm going to fill you with my spirit. Not so you can just sit in here. But so I can send you back out there. So no, gone are the days or come from among them. And be ye separate. Now the language is I'll fill you with my spirit. And walk among all of them. Lay hands on all of them. Pray over all of them. The language is now, I need you filled with the spirit. Teacher, principal, whoever it is. And when you walk in that classroom, you plead the blood over every seat, every chair, every doorpost. No shooter is coming in this school right here. The languages of men. If I'm going to send you to the mountains, some may be familiar with it this way, to the mountains, you got to speak the language. Some of you may be familiar with this teaching of the seven mountains. If I send you to the mountain of entertainment, you got to speak the language. If I send you to the mountain of government, you got to speak the language. If I send you to the mountain of the military and armed forces, you got to speak the language. Do you have a testimony that you can speak down on the inside of you in a way that people can understand without compromising the core tenets of the faith? Somebody shout the languages of men. The language, I'm done. So on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2 verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit Enabled them. Acts 2, verse 4. All of them were filled. Help me, media. Acts 2, verse 4. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Glory to God. Give me D. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. There we go. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Go down to verse number five. I'm going to close with these verses and then I'm going to get out your way. Verse number five, Acts 2, verse number five, the very next verse. Acts 2, verse number five. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews, from every nation under heaven. Verse number six. I don't know I didn't have this one here either. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment 
because each one heard their own language being spoken in verse number four it says they spoke in other tongues that word in the Greek glossa where we get our English word glossary they spoke in other languages but I told you in verse number six it says and when they heard their own languages being spoken that word in the original Greek is dialectos meaning their dialects so when the spirit filled the people not only did God speak the language but he said there's some that have a different dialect not only will my spirit help you speak the language but I'll help you speak the dialect I feel like preaching here this morning then in verse number 7 let's keep going verse number 7 that says they were amazed because they said aren't all these who are speaking Galileans oh, glory to God in other words because they had accents y'all don't hear what I'm saying this is not the first time that Peter has gotten in trouble for this before if I go back to Matthew chapter two, I wish I had some Bible readers to Matthew chapter 26 around verse number 73 Jesus had just been crucified and they said aren't you the one that was with him and Peter said no 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 I don't know the man and then a second person says I remember you you were the one that was with him and he said no 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 I don't know the man but it was the third time that Peter said surely I'm not one of them and someone says yes you are because your accent gives you away you are a Galilean not a Palestinian so when God came on the day of Pentecost he dealt with the language he dealt with the dialects he dealt with the accent I feel like preaching but then the Bible says that it lists all of these nations and he said all of these people were there it says the Parthians were there it says the Cretans were there it says the, the Arabs were there it says people from Mesopotamia were there so there were people there if you look at the list and do a little research there were people who were there who were from the same language family even though they spoke different languages they were in the same language family can I keep preaching this morning but the Bible says that there were some that were there if you do a little research they had an isolate language the Elamite language was an isolate language that language didn't descend from anybody nobody taught them that language so how in the world would they know that language unless the Spirit of God enabled them to speak that language I'm here to prophesy to somebody in this room that God is getting ready to take you somewhere slap that neighbor high five and say neighbor oh that's the wrong person slap that other neighbor high five say neighbor I'm excited about where God is getting ready to take you turn to the other person they didn't get excited yet tell the neighbor I'm getting ready to praise God for where he's about to take you your eyes have not seen your ears have not heard it hasn't entered into your mind what God has prepared for you in the future you need to go ahead and start praising him now for where he's called you to go ahead and praise him now for where he's sending you to go ahead and thank him now for how he'll use you in that arena still sitting there slouch that neighbor up out of their seat and say neighbor I'll pull you out of that rut and come on and walk with me 
God is taking you somewhere and I'm going to walk with you while you go. Stop that neighbor high five. Grab that other one by the hand and shake him and shake him and shake him. Grab him and shake him. Shake him and rock him. And say, neighbor, God is getting ready to take you somewhere. But if you're going to go, you got to speak the language. The language. The languages of men. You're getting ready to read financial statements you've never read before. You're getting ready to sit in boardrooms you've never read before. You're getting ready to sit amongst leaders you haven't sat amongst before. Now open up your mouth and give God some praise. Find one more person and say, do you know the language? The languages. The languages of men. The languages of men. God wants to send us to industries, whatever synonymous term you want to use, mountains. Same concept, I'm just using different terms. God wants to send us places, but there's a language that goes with it. And you have to be open to the language. I feel like I'm skipping ahead and getting ahead of myself. Maybe I'll preach this on graduation Sunday or maybe not. This is what made Daniel so powerful. This is why God was able to use him. This is why he could be number two and number three. While kingdoms are transitioning, that never happens. If you know history and anything in antiquity, when, when a new nation came in, they would slaughter everybody, anybody in your cabinet, anybody under you. But Daniel was so powerful. He was well-educated in the ways of the Babylonians. The Bible says he could understand all types of mysteries, all types of math, all types of learning, all types of literature, the Bible says in Daniel 1. To the point that even when the Babylonians were waylaid by the Persians, they had a job for them in the Persian house. And God was able to use him to give prophecies so far down. So far down the road that a lot of them won't even be fulfilled until Jesus returns. He could see things in the intertestamental period, what we call the period of silence, when there's no canon, when there's no Bible written between Malachi and Matthew. He says, let me tell you what's going to happen during that time too. Because he spoke so many languages. Literally, but you get what I'm saying in the spirit. God was able to use them. God wants to take you. This is what made New Testament, New Covenant example, Paul so powerful. Everybody has a call to something. But where Peter would eventually have to fade away as the lead, Paul stepped forward because he was so smart. He spoke so many languages. He had such a high intellect where he literally could sit 
with the Socrates and the Aristotles of his day. He was on their level of thinking and intellect. And God could use him to reach so many people. Where Peter could only mostly be used for Jews. Paul says, I'll go Jews, Gentiles. I'll go to anybody. When Peter... I'm in the Word now. I hope y'all read your Bibles because I'm not going to have time to give you references for all of this. When Peter had trouble because his walls went back up, anybody know the book of Acts? And he didn't want to sit and be seen sitting and eating with a certain group of people. And Paul confronted him, the Bible says, to his face. I didn't write letters. I write letters to churches, but you, I'll talk to you to your face. You got to understand how bold this is. The lead apostle at the time. Jesus is number one. And where he had issues in that area, Paul says to the weak, I'll become weak. To the Gentile, I'll become like a Gentile. To the Jew, I'll become like a Jew. We could talk, yeah, we could sit and talk law and Torah all day. Let's talk about that. Oh, you don't know the Torah, you're a Gentile? Romans chapter 2. Well, let me just talk to you about the law of your conscience and how you don't speak that. Let me talk to you about the law of your conscience then. Since you don't believe it, see, can you speak the language? I always tell myself, God, don't let me become so heavenly minded where I become no earthly good. Help me to always be trained in the exercise of making the gospel palatable to people where they can understand without compromising the faith. I can still give you the truth, but I can give it to you in a way. Do you know why you're standing here? Because at some point, God spoke your language. God had a way of revealing himself to you and he has a way of revealing himself to me. He can make himself real to anybody. So if he can speak my language, can I at least not be open to speaking the languages of men so that I may save some? and lead them to Christ. God is getting ready. Every head bowed, every eye closed. God is getting ready to use you in arenas, in industries. Don't think of glam, don't think of flashing lights for some that may be a part of it, but it's bigger than that. It's your life's purpose. Some God is calling you to the schools I pray for our school systems and our school teachers and our counselors and all of the educators we have in our church. We've been blessed with a group of them, a number of them, past and present, retired and still active. There's a ministry you have now like never before. I heard the statistic that more children are dying in schools than police officers in active duty. It's more dangerous to be a student in school right now than to be a police officer walking the street. So if you're going to be in there, you got to speak the languages. Some of God is calling some of you to that. Some of you, God is calling you to the armed forces. You've been there. There are many people here that can raise their hand who have been there. They're retired, who are now helping veterans, helping black veterans, helping veterans of color helping all types of veterans in different places. They speak that language. I couldn't go there. I don't know that language. I've never spent a day in the service. But God called them and they speak that language. There's some of you in this room, God is calling you to the prisons. I don't want to tell this story. I'll give him to tell it one day, but I've heard him tell the story how he got into it. How our chaplain here at the church, how he got into going to prisons. When he saw a dear family member that was close to him go to prison at a very young age. And from that moment, he had a connection. He got into some of his own legal troubles. You don't mind. I won't tell everything. I'll give you to tell it. 
He got in some of his own legal troubles. And then God called him into the prisons. Because now he speaks their language. God is sending you all somewhere. There's fitness and structures in the room. There's a language that you speak. God is going to use you in the area of health and wellness. There are finance people, real estate people in this room. We need anointed real estate people now, more now than ever before. I don't like what I see. I'm not trying to be a prophet of doom and gloom, but I just don't like where it's going. Corporations coming in, buying out whole neighborhoods where people can't even own them. You will not buy now. Now you'll be a renter. First, I forced you to buy and gave you these bad interest rates. Redlined the districts. You can only stay within a certain locale. And the houses in this locale are only going to have so much value. Now let me adjust the rules again. And let me take advantage of you this way. So we're going to need anointed people that speak the language. That can say what thus says the Lord. We need some anointed economist. You're going to need Holy Spirit to fix what's happening right now. Not to be negative again, trillions in deficits. You're going to need some spirit-filled people. To say this is how you're going to survive. We're going to need, watch this, some Bible readers, some Agabuses. For it was Agabus who prophesied the economic downturn in Rome and the book of Acts. We're going to need some prophets to say, here's what I'm seeing. Now let me throw the ball to the anointed finance person and they'll tell you what to do. Somebody's got to speak the language. Am I talking too high for you? Or can you hear me in the spirit? God is going to take you to these places but you're going to have to speak the language some of you, you know you're anointed to do something, here's how you know because even without any formal training I'm not saying this to brag on myself or anything I was preaching for 10 years before I had any formal training before I learned anything about a hermeneutical triad, before I learned anything about an epochal horizon, before I learned anything about a canonical horizon, all those things they teach you in seminary. I was preaching long before that because Holy Spirit will download and give you a language. You'll be able to understand theological concepts that people spend decades sitting in seminaries to learn. You just have a gift for it naturally. Because that's what you're called to do. Some of you just had natural gifts. Gifts of cooking, gifts of all types of things you've just done naturally. Sewing, gifts of graphic art and design. I don't know what it is. You just had photography, all types of things. Nobody taught you, you just taught yourself. Not trying to brag on just my family. Before my brother even went to school and had any formal training, he built my website. Just playing around. Just new computers and coding. Just new all types of things in media without any formal training, when he used to make our, our New Year's Eve and year-end videos, without sitting in a school to learn anything. God has a way of giving you the language. Some of you in this room, the reason I'm saying all that, Holy Spirit, I feel your Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit is about to give you the language of the industry. Maybe you haven't gone to school and you're hanging your head, maybe you haven't had any formal training. I'm not against it. Go get it. Get all you can. But what I'm saying to you, there may be someone in this room that say, I may be too old to do that. Maybe it's too late for you. The Holy Spirit is going to redeem the time. And he's going to give you the language. You're going to know things you didn't otherwise. This is why you have to be here this morning, June 5th, 2022, at 12.05. We're supposed to have given communion, be singing hallelujah at this time. But you had to be here for this download. 
on Pentecost Sunday, he's about to give you the language. When you walk out that door, some of you are going to know things you didn't know before you came in here. Some of you are going to have interests in things you didn't even have before you came in here. Because Holy Spirit is getting ready to do so on the day of Pentecost. When they were all together in one place, in one accord, God gave them the languages. He gave you the language of art and dance, the language of acting. Without any formal training, if I'm correct, right? He just gives you that language. You just know. I have people in this room who can raise their hand about how God used them to do various things that they're in right now without any formal training. God is going to use you. I've gone on long enough. Do you receive the word of the Lord this morning? Come on, let's give God praise for how he spoke to us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.